Hello, welcome back. It is now my pleasure to introduce you to the moderator for our next session. Chris Livacari is the head of school of Presidio Knowles School and an educator, author, and former US diplomat who served in Tokyo and Shanghai as a vice counsel, deputy press attache, and as deputy director of the Tokyo American Center. He was previously the senior advisor for China Learning Initiatives at Asia Society for the Center for Global Education, the Chinese program director at Silicon Valley International School in Palo Alto, and a member of the board of trustees of Chinese American International Schools in San Francisco. So I want you to please welcome Chris to the stage and the rest of the panelists, and we'll get started with our next session. Thank you, Neelam. Thanks everybody for being here. So many wonderful friends, such great energy here today at the conference. Um, I'm joined by a really wonderful, exciting panel that represents all aspects of our work, K-12, higher education, the nonprofit sector, and we do have a guest coming all the way from London here so as well. So before we get, yeah, it's gonna be really interesting. Uh, we're talking about global exchange in the context of, of current events, what we're doing at schools, what we're doing at the government level, et cetera, et cetera. But before we get started and set the scene, I just wanna ask each of my co-panelists here to briefly introduce themselves. So we'll start down at the end with Wang Lao Shi. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Wen Ting Wang. I'm the director of academics at the Yuming Charter School in Oakland. We're the first public Mandarin immersion schools in California. And we have two campuses, three campuses. Um, yeah. And tomorrow we're gonna host 30 educators around the nation. We're looking forward to your visit. I'll pass it to Catherine. Hello, I'm Catherine Carruthers, and I'm the one from London. I <laughs> work at the Institute of Education, which is part of um, UCL in London, University College London. And I'm the director of the Chinese, um, the Center for Chinese Language Education, which has two main strands of work. One, since 2006, we've been a, um, a Confucius Institute, actually with Peking University, and that's enabled us to sort of work towards mainstreaming Chinese in the school curriculum. That's the focus very much in schools. And then the other strand is to, well, I'll talk a bit more about that later, is to run a government program called the Mandarin Excellence Program, which is working across 80 schools in the UK and kind of transforming Mandarin education. Hi, my name is Jie Zhang. I'm an associate professor at the University of Oklahoma. So I've been working in the Chinese program as well as the MATSO program. So my research is more on second language acquisition, foreign language pedagogy, and specifically Chinese as a foreign language. I also have the pleasure to serve as the executive director of the Chinese Language Teachers Association. Very nice to see everyone here. Hi everyone, my name is Shen Zhan Liao. I'm the Senior Vice President of Education at China Institute in America. My honor to join the panel and Chris here. Uh, we are a nonprofit started in 1926, founded by four scholars, uh, Zhang Duwei, um, Paul Monroe from Columbia University, and uh, Hu Shi and Guo Bingwen. Uh, so we truly, for nearly 100 years, uh, we are at the forefront promoting Chinese culture. Language education is an essential part of what we are doing. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you all. So you can see we're all working at different levels, but we have lots of shared challenges, lots of shared opportunities. Um, on the panel today, we have, for me, two old friends, Sun Zhan. I was always jealous of China Institute's history because we at Asia Society were only like started in 1950-something. Uh, but we worked a couple blocks from each other. And I have had the privilege of bringing Catherine on a road trip uh, in the US to visit schools. And she just had so many shocked, surprise observations about our crazy dysfunctional American educational system. But that's a story for another day, of course. I want to set the scene here before we get to our panel. Uh, I want to set the stage with three scenes from my own life that I think bring out three of the main themes or strands that we're trying to talk about today. The first theme we're going to be talking about is the broader context, and particularly the US-China relationship, or the UK-China relationship in Catherine's case. And the scene I want to set is 2012. 
I don't know how many of you were involved with NCLC and things like that back then, but in 2012, I remember it was the golden age of US-China educational exchange. We had President Obama, Hu Jintao, we had the 100,000 Strong Initiative. I remember bringing students to Howard University to hear Michelle Obama promote US-China educational exchange. And look how things have shifted since then. Back in 2012, we had about 15,000 American university students in China. Just before the COVID pandemic hit, we only had about 3,000. And the numbers for right now are a little bit difficult to come by, but many are putting them just in the, in the hundreds, not even the thousands. So there's a lot of work to do, and I think our panelists are gonna be people who help us do that. So broader context. Second scene I want to set for, for you is a little bit more personal because the other thing we're going to talk about today is the student impact of global exchange and experiential learning opportunities. And I'm going to talk about my son, uh, whose name is Zhu Xuan. Zhu Xuan was adopted from Taiwan when he was eight years old. So he was an, an, older, an older kid when he came to us native Mandarin speaker. Well, Ji Xuan came from Taiwan and came to uh, my school, my former school in Palo Alto, Silicon Valley International School. Uh, and basically we adopted Ji Xuan, took him to California. About a month later, uh, we had a group of visitors, students coming from Hangzhou, from uh, Zhedao Fuxiao, came to visit our school. And I'm driving my car in the back seat. I have Zhu Xuan, who just came from Taiwan, and two girls from Hangzhou. And the girls look at him and they said, Hey, Zhu Xuan, why is your Chinese not standard? Oh, is it because you're in the United States? i Well, he'd only been with us for like three weeks. So it wasn't that. So at some point, he says, Oh, what's the Taiwan lighter? And the girl says, Taiwan is China. And Zhu Xuan said, Really? He couldn't understand. So, wonderful opportunity for me as an educator. Kids from Taiwan, kids from mainland China. Suddenly they realize they're living in two very different worlds. That Zhu Xuan thinks Taiwan is clearly an independent country that has nothing to do with those people over there. Clearly the girls in Hangzhou think Taiwan is a, an integral part of China. So it was a wonderful opportunity both for me and for the kids to begin to open their eyes to new perspectives and some of those thorny cultural challenges that we deal with. The funny part for me is that Ju Xuan walked away feeling like so proud. He's like, oh, they, they love us so much. They want us to be part of them. And he was really excited. So we had a lot of education to do for my boy. <laughs> um, final scene, this one's very quick. Uh, a few weeks ago, as you know, uh, Taiwan had a huge earthquake, and my students, uh, my seventh grade students, were there completing a, a photojournalism project on Taiwanese identity, again, leading into those hard issues. But I thought it was great because the earthquake hit, and our, one of our teachers wrote, immediately wrote an email to all the parents that ended with the most beautiful line ever, I thought. It said, and the locals just went back to eating their breakfast. And I thought, what a, what a lovely way to just like bring down those parent anxieties. So setting the stage with those three scenes from my life, and then we're going to hear a lot about what's happening, again, at all levels uh, in terms of global exchange. So let's start with uh, innovative approaches, what different schools are doing. And we're going to start at the K-12 level. Um, Wang Lao, she's going to talk about her wonderful school, Yuming. And if you don't know much about Yuming, if you're not from this area, they have really garnered huge attention for all of the work that they've done and establishing a really solid charter school presence out here. So, Wendy, tell us more about what you all are doing with regard to exchange. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, just to our audience today, we are a charter school, public charter school, and we just bring our 39 8th graders to China just this spring. They just came back from China in March. And our program, we call it Chinese Study Tour. And we call it because it's not just a trip 
to go to China and experience the food there and experience the culture there, but most important is a study tour for those students who has been in the Mandarin immersion system for nine years and really used what they have been learning for the past nine years languagely and also like culturally immersed in the authentic environment. And what's unique about our program is we are not just um, like a tourist tour and a trip to go to China. We also have tailored to educate our students to thinking about their identities. There's a three identity we want the students to reflect during this 17 days trip in China. The first is a bilingual learner, and the second identity is a global citizen, and the third identity is the global uh, change maker, So during the 17 days in China, the students has a lot of opportunities by doing the community service in Yangshuo and also visiting the top boarding private schools in Shanghai. And also we visit Beijing as well. So during all these 17 days, our students immersed into those activities and reflect on those identities. As a change maker, what are some change uh, as a global citizen that I can make to the society, to the world that we are currently living? And also, as a bilingual learner, what does it mean to me as a bilingual learner? How am I going to apply those languages and the culture that has been you know, learning for the past nine years really into my life and also carry those identities going forward to their life in the future once they go into the high school, into the college, or you know, when they grow up an adult. So we really educate our students since the beginning even kindergarten, we ask our students to reflect on those identities. So we just grow on a seed. As a kindergartner, they probably don't even know those big world, big words. Even as adults, like it's hard to reflect. But yeah, this is really towards the end of our program, eighth grade. Our students gonna go on this 17 days trip, a study tour in China, and reflect immersed um, in in this trip. And do you see it sort of in their eyes and their faces when they come back? Is there, some, is there some palpable change to them that you notice or that their parents or their teachers notice when they come back from the trip? Um, the shocking, I mean, yeah, for sure, you know, by the time that we bring them to the China and they all shocked by the things they've never seen. And American, just a very example, um, during the first lunch, they ask for the cold water the ice water, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, in China, we don't serve that. No. Yeah. And even in a hotel, it's hard to find it. And our students are just from that little thing. We're not just, uh, you know, use that ice water and say, oh, just go find ice water. This is a problem. And from there, how you can challenge yourself and thinking about how to solve it. Use your language to ask for it instead of coming to me and as a chaperone teacher to ask ice water for you. Come on, you're eighth graders, so you gotta figure out how to do it. So this is just everything that we experience, we're gonna tie to the three identities we want them to reflect during this trip. I love that anecdote because I'm getting a little bit old now, but I first went to China in 1994, and I did exactly what you're describing. I had lots of visitors to my home, like hundreds of them, because I was at a small university. And what did I do? I kept serving them cold drinks, and I was like, <laughs> why is nobody taking these drinks? And like, finally, I, I learned. So all of these little things are places we can lean into for, for our students, so that's lovely. Um, so, John Lao, should tell us a little bit, we heard a little bit about, you know, what Yuming is doing at the, at the middle school level. There's obviously a lot of interest in the universities and what they're doing. So, can you tell us a little bit about, both from your perspective as a professor and as the director of CLTA, what are we seeing at the university level? Yeah, so as Chris mentioned, the number of uh, American students studying uh, abroad in China has changed drastically uh, before the COVID and after the COVID. Before COVID, we are looking at the numbers around 15,000 students every year going to uh, study abroad in China. And since, the, uh, since COVID, it, the number has dropped to 200 to 300. And there is another change is the location change. So before, uh, COVID
COVID, according to our most recent survey from the Chinese Language Teachers Association, pre-COVID, over 80% of study abroad programs are in Chinese cities. And since COVID, um, over 60% have been moved to Taiwan. And all the Chinese uh, flagship programs have been moved to Taiwan as well. So there is that change. Um, and as you know, because of China's lockdown policy, um, a lot of uh, language exchange programs and uh, school partnership programs have been suspended during the pandemic. And since last year, such programs have slowly started to reinstate for the first time. Um, and we are seeing saying some new innovative approaches to uh, these uh, you know, uh, programs. For example, the CET program last year, they implemented a new approach that is uh, practice-based language learning and incorporated the uh, traditional Chinese you know, classroom language learning experience with more uh, practice-based um, study tours to different cities in China. So this past summer, they were able to to uh, incorporate um, culture uh, uh, tours to uh, different sites in Chengdu area. And they actually, the students had the opportunity to learn about these different sites before their trip. And they, with the help of their teachers, they designed, you know, they participated in all different language activities and designed interview questions. Uh, and then during the trip, um, they were able to interview uh, the local people in the Yulin uh, community. They were able to participate in a live streaming at a hot pot uh, restaurant. And they were able to uh, recite Du Fu's poem uh, in front of the Du Fu Cao Tang. So these are, so they are not just a tourist. They were able to really uh, interact with the local people and use what they learned from classrooms um, in their, you know, actual, uh, actual life. So, um, and after the trip, students were engaged in uh, writing essays about their experience, um, make oral presentations, and make videos to reflect on such experience. And their feedback has been uh, very positive, um, and uh, it's saying the benefits of practice-based uh, project-based language learning uh, study abroad programs. I think that would be the direction for future um, study abroad programs. Um, and also, uh, as far as I know, there are more and more universities in China who are offering such tailor-made um, practice-based culture tours to American students. Yeah. yeah, those are some new changes. It's interesting. It seems like one theme that's already emerged is this idea of what we say at our school a little bit, we, we've always say like our kids, that we want them to be travelers, not tourists. And that seems to be very much what the both the two of you are also talking about. How about the reception of the kids when they go there? I think you know there's a perception, again, about US-China relations and where we are in this tense moment. But what's the reaction of the, the local folks that the kids are, are interacting with to these young Americans coming to, to China? Yeah, I can see from, you know, from the average people's interaction, like both sides are very uh, friendly and welcoming. They really look forward to such opportunities to <clears throat> exchange ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I should also mention, I didn't at the outset, that we were supposed to also be joined by Madeline Ross, who uh, is the president of the US-China Education Trust. And she had to cancel her trip at the very last minute. But Madeline was going to talk a little bit more about the broader context of US-China relations and how it's impacting. So we're going to try to weave some of her themes in. But we were lucky enough to include uh, Shenzhen here from China Institute. And as I said, China Institute is a really unique institution. Um, and there's so many things going on. So we've heard a little bit about the K-12 sector, the university sector. What is China Institute doing right now in terms of its global exchanges? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so. I want to go back to when you mentioned the bigger context mm -hmm. uh, that, well, back in 2012, when yeah. it's the peak time for exchange, uh, we see the thriving of people-to-people -people exchange, and then now it's a different world. Um, but we are seeing, uh, it's, we, we are using the word relaunch and resuming, reconnecting and rebuilding. I'm really um, congratulated to both Wang Laoshi and Zhang Laoshi. You bring your students there to start this um, 
really irreplaceable experience for students. So what we are looking at, because before the pandemic, we also, every year, every summer, we, bring, we brought uh, high school students to China. Mm -hmm. We brought educators and school leaders to China primarily focusing on language education. Um, but after the pandemic, last year in October, uh, I actually brought a group of principals uh, from New York City to China for the first time. And this summer, uh, we just recruited a, uh, a youth leadership program for high school students uh, for the first two uh, weeks in July. No, sorry, not the first two weeks, uh, the, the, second, the second part of the July. Uh, to China. So the idea is, well, to reconnect and rebuild, we need to rebuild the trust. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of break and interruption during the pandemic, and with the tension, the bigger context between US and China, and also there are uh, personnel changes during the pandemic. Some of the principals, the superintendents, the teachers who used to be the key persons um, connecting uh, schools for students. Now, maybe we, we are looking at, well, some well-established programs looking for new leaders, mm. new teachers. So the idea is, well, we, br we brought the principals to China, opened the doors, opened their minds, and then we're also following that up uh, with student trips. Mm -hmm. So quite a few of the schools that, well, the principals was in China with me in October, and we are getting their students to China this summer. Uh, there, we, we have seen uh, there are resources, uh, and we all have perhaps well heard or talked about the 50,000 yeah. uh, after the, uh, uh, the Xi and the Biden yeah. summit last November. Yeah. Um, and there are opportunities and resources that's available, but uh, again, there are also challenges as well. Yeah, at least San Francisco, we're getting pandas. That looks like a, you know, a positive step forward. But you can hear in the US, as, as, as a general rule, we're not doing very well right now with, with our exchanges with China. Um, Catherine, the UK seems to be really kind of one-upping us in terms of their relationship with China. What, what's going on in, in the UK? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Tell us more. On a people to people in terms of yeah. education, maybe. Um, I think. We have moved on. We, we haven't, we've had to give our pandas back from Edinburgh Zoo. They have gone. So we're oh. no pandas at the moment. So okay. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> we, um, I think things have changed since the, the golden era for the UK was when there were Xi Jinping and um, David Cameron having a pint in an Oxfordshire pub. That was 2015. Yeah. Um, things have changed now, and there is a lot of sort of dialogue. Um, but a general consensus that building China capability, which includes language learning, obviously, and engaging with China is really important. Um, I think it has improved for the UK. Well, after this, um, the Xi Jinping Biden meeting in November, it did make things easier, actually. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, you know, we're quite small fry in comparison to the US-China relationship. So we've been op carried on operating with um, a very innovative program, which I wanted to tell you about, which actually the the, um, the England, because it's complicated in the UK, but education's devolved. So England is completely separate from Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland in terms of education. And we run a program for our Department for Education called the Mandarin Excellence Program. Um, schools can apply to join, they get a small amount of funding, but what is really, really different is the children on this program study Chinese for eight hours a week four taught hours and four hours of self-study. Um, and they're across 80 schools across, the, across England now. Um, it's been going since 2016. And it has transformed Mandarin learning because surprise, surprise, even if you give British kids enough, lang enough curriculum time, they do rather well. That's much, much more than the average 11 year old goes, gets. They have to go from 11 right through to 16 with this program once they sign up for it. So it's quite serious. Um, and it has had, you know, I think life-changing results for the children on the program and really changed these children um, from tourists into, into cultural travelers. But just going on to the exchange point of view is the, the big carrot in this program for the learners is that at the end of year nine, which is when they've been doing it for three years, so when they're 14, they get a trip to China. 
Um, and I can talk later about the, the virtual work that we've been doing, which had some, you know, some merits, but this summer, we did a pilot last autumn, but this summer we're taking 1,350 year nine. So 1,350 yeah. 14-year-olds from, I think, just under 60 schools altogether um, to China. They will go to different places. Even Beijing can't take that many all at once. They will go yeah. to a, a number of different centers. Um, and it will be coordinated because we work with the British Council on this by the British Council in China, but very much um, on the basis that you were talking about. So they will learn language in the mornings, but then they will go and actually use it in terms of finding the way, in terms of bargaining, or last, you know, when the pilot we did, um, they learned how to talk about the weather in a bit more detail in the morning, then they went to the Chinese weather center, CCTV weather center, and had a go at um, presenting weather um, in the television center, obviously not to live audiences. But, so we're very much getting them to use their language, but this gives, these are children, many of whom have never been abroad before, um, never mind gone to China, mm -hmm. but have been learning it. And what we've noticed particularly is that despite the fact that the geopolitical stuff has been quite you know, loud, and sometimes when I'm in London, I feel, oh my goodness, dealing with that and the advocacy around that is, is quite tough. But when you get into schools, the head teachers, the children themselves, and the parents, nothing has changed on that basis. We have had no school governors coming to us. I think I've had one in the last seven years, uh, sort of something from a school governor saying, well, why are we doing Chinese? What, what's, the, what's the point of doing Chinese so we don't get on with China? But nothing else. So actually, the energy is still very much there, just like there is in this conference today, for, and the appetite from the learners. You're blazing a trail for us. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, 1,350 14-year-olds. Yes. Amazing. <laughs> it is amazing. quite amazing, yes. I try not to think about it. Are they going to try their best not to be mistaken for Americans? That's the question. <laughs> you know, the, the Canadians are very good at this. They're always wearing their flags and make sure that they are not mistaken for us. Um, but that's a nice segue into the, the impact that you mentioned that these programs are having on kids. And I think there are you know, a couple of maybe questions here. One is about what the positive impacts that we're seeing and how it shapes and develops our kids. And then also like, what does success look like for us? Like how are we measuring some of that impact or some of the, the effect of those experiences on our students? So from your perspective, how are you seeing the, maybe the positive impact of some of your global exchange programs on your, on your children? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll talk about the two positive impact and the first from the language perspective. Mm. I think um, the current audience who are, is current to the Chinese teacher or used to be the Chinese teachers, that um, you would experience a challenge to uh, maybe you would challenge the students to speak Chinese in front of you, right? Even though we talk Chinese for many years, but students are still shy or doesn't want to speak and uh, they have tons of the excuse. My tone is so weird. I don't want to talk about pushing, pushing. Um, but after 17 days in China, yeah. our students, once they come back to our school, they start, they, they, one student comment on it. It feels like I'm speaking Chinese so naturally. And the other, other students, is, they even speak Chinese. They don't even notice that. They speak Chinese to our other subject the teachers. Mm -hmm. And the other subjects, teachers is like, what you're talking about? They're still in that mindset of, you know, I have to speak. This is a part of a requirement of a program. They have to speak Mandarin with each other and to the adults um, mm -hmm. that in China. So this is from the language perspective. If you ever uh, were language teachers, that you teach students Chinese, just bring them back to the authentic environment. Once they immerse in there, you know, they will feel the use of this language and that they will feel like, oh, I, I learn it, I can use it. And the other perspective is from the culture perspective, like I mentioned previously, um, except Beijing, we also did the five-day community surveys yeah. in Yangshuo. So, um, so before they departure, we got connections in, uh, with the Yangshuo local government and find a very rural area, that village school, mm. and we ask that school, what are needs from your school, and we would like to help. So they would give us a list of what they need. They want us to build a garden for them. They want us to build a library for them. Mm -hmm. They also want our students to teach the English class to their students as well, as this is their first time to have this opportunity. 
So um, our students start to brainstorm what are some, because our, we are public schools and uh, um, this trip we already ask families to pay for their trip and we have very limited funding to buy whatever that the school needed. So everything that coming from like to that school has to fundraise to buy the students. So our mm -hmm. students have like tremendous ideas of uh, how to do the fundraising. They will do the big sale, they will do the tutoring camp and they use those mm -hmm. money to buy the books and to buy those like muckers and crayons that are used as a donation to that school. We even at towards the end we have enough money to buy a broadcast system to oh. their schools. That's what they dreamed wow. for like ten years wow. that they were able to. So it's just one impact. And the other way is once our students in that area and saw that village school, the students never to that Yangshu is but to that village, the students never out of that village for their life. And our students just bring so much to them. And um, our students just bring, um, bring a lot of like a different perspective, talking them in yeah. Chinese for sure, yeah. and build the gardens so throughout the five days. I think our students get the identity of as a change maker. I'm the change maker. Yeah. Yeah, right? Because I'm making the changes to, to them, to the students, to the schools. Um, and also, what are some the other areas that they're seeing the problems of you know, what they see in that school that I can continue to thinking about. So they actually form a group after they came back and they actually form a group and they continue to do this tutoring and they're gonna fund those monies and then they're gonna every year, they're gonna donate those monies to the school. So there's like, yeah, long lasting yeah. impact, a positive impact yeah. um, that on our students. I love the way you framed it because sometimes I think programs get very fixated on language and language outcomes and yeah. on a 17 or 20 day trip, I mean, you're probably not gonna get huge gains on language. Yeah. But the other things you're talking about, not only culture, but I love the way you also talked about the identity piece, which is so important and their ability to be change makers. So I would encourage anyone who's thinking about exchange program to use that similar framework in their thinking. John Lasha, how about you? How are you looking at the, the positive impact of some of this work uh, with your students? Yeah, so uh, Wang Lasha has mentioned the most important gains of the study abroad programs, that's uh, linguistic and cultural. Um, I also want to mention that uh, such programs also helps tremend uh, tremendously with the students' um, you know, learning motivation. So when they have the opportunity to study abroad in China or in Taiwan, they really um, you know, help them to just get a um, more like intrinsic motivation to learn the language and to sustain their learning, which is very important. Mm. So I, I like to use uh, one student's example. So I had a student um, several years ago who went to study abroad for the first time in his summer of freshman year. So um, he stayed at Yunnan for two months and had an amazing experience. So upon coming back, he just kept applying for different scholarships scholarships going to China. <laughs> so then he went uh, through the critical language program for another summer. And while he was there, he applied for a uh, Qinghua program that allowed him to stay uh, in Qinghua for a whole year. And then he applied for something in Taiwan and stayed in Taiwan for another half year. And when he returned, he just you know became one of the first Truman Scholars at our university. Um, and with the Truman Scholarship, uh, he was able to work uh, full time after graduation at the uh, Department of Com uh, Commerce here in the US. So it just tremendously you know, changed his life trajectory and he just become a life you know lifelong uh, learner um, and also I want to, to mention that not just for motivation um, study abroad also helps the students to build their confidence. So when they return from such programs, they become more confident. That easily translates into classroom uh, performance. You can see their active participation. You can see their better academic performance. You can see everything, like they're willing to talk and they have a better pronunciation and better speaking and more fluency. So it's, it's just overall a very positive 
negative experience. And the other thing is, um, which is very important for college and the university language programs, is how such study abroad programs help our enrollment and the numbers in Chinese majors and the minors. Yeah. Because according to uh, our most recent survey, 70% of university programs actually require study abroad as their Chinese major requirement. So they need to study abroad. And when they come back, they usually bring back credit hours if they go through a summer program. For example, if it's a two month, uh, eight week program, they usually bring back three credit hours. If they go for a semester, that's usually around 15 to 18 credit hours that can be easily applied to their major or minor uh, uh, degree requirements. And they can just, you know, have a uh, you know, accelerated program to become a Chinese major or minor, which is so important for us. So lots of practical benefits oh, yeah. as well, both for the program and for the kids. Mm -hmm. Shenzhen, I think I first, when I was teaching in New York many years ago, I think I first sent my students to China in, in like 2005, 2006 on China Institute programs. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit how you're looking at the impact of such a long history of global exchange at China Institute. Yeah, it's, well, one is well, it's a long trajectory, how deep and how thorough one's life can be transformed yeah. by this kind of study tour. Another one is really both teachers mentioned, well, the multifaceted in impact, not only just the language skills, but also really it's the, uh, the, the holistic experience, culturally, emotionally. And um, so for the, like since 2005, we actually, we brought students to China and we developed this more of a language immersion, language and culture immersion program, host uh, home, home stay yeah. for four weeks, and uh, the students would learn intensive, mm -hmm. uh, through intensive classes to learn the language. They oftentimes will really fast speed uh, one year in terms of language studies uh, for that. Well, four weeks, some, well, we first started with six weeks and then uh, um, cut that into four weeks. But this time, after the pandemic, we actually, uh, this program, two-week program, uh, it's a youth leadership program. It's open to students, not just for learning Chinese language. Mm -hmm. It's actually open to everyone with an interest to China. Uh, we were just, uh, we just completed the interview of each applicant, and it's just uh, so moving how yeah. students, with or without, Chinese language learning background while well, they're interested in this program. The design is while well, they go there, they not only uh, go through the cultural classes, the, uh, the excursions, but through school visits, each one of them would prepare a project that either they have already completed within their school or they are working on. It could be STEM, it could be um, art, it could be language if they're working on Chinese language. And the theme is uh, One World, Our Future. Uh, the idea is really to build the mutual understanding through the young generations, because they are the future. And when we do the info session, uh, we speak directly to the students coming to the info session. You are the future of our two countries, which are the two of the most important countries for the, for the years to come. So we, we really want to build that kind of understanding yeah. uh, through language and through this type of cultural experience. Um, and you present to each other what topics you are interested in. So through the application, we had students um, um, preparing like a, a waste recycle uh, project for medical um, uh, wastes or, or a global warming. And, and one student, uh, actually he's very much into, into science. He didn't study Chinese. Uh, he's, he, pre he prepared a project that would clean the, um, the, the trash in the outer space. Uh, because there are, it's so conjected now, yeah. so you want to do that or before it's get, before it's too late. That's a very important U.S.-China collaboration, I think, given given the space race. So that program, 2005, was the first year. I remember actually sending one or two students on that. That's amazing. <laughs> oh my God, we're getting so old. 20 years on. <laughs> um, maybe moving forward a little bit. So uh, so many exciting things happening. So much positive impact. But there are challenges, uh, particularly in the current climate. Catherine, how are you looking at 
the, the opportunity that you have before you in terms of what are some of the, the key like challenges, obstacles that you've had to navigate as you think about running such impactful programs uh, in China? Yeah, okay, so I'll just add just one very quick thing on the yeah, previous theme was, um, that nobody's actually said, because the others are very similar, is the other thing about um, impact is advocacy. We were talking about advocacy in the pre previous panel. You, mostly with these very big trips, you're gonna take more than just your Chinese teacher with you. So you're gonna take your geography teacher, your history teacher, etc. These guys, in general, in my experience, come back China enthused. Yeah, and they can be right. really, really helpful because they loved it. They generally love it. I mean, and they don't have to worry about the language learning because they don't know much about that. They're just there to support. And they have a ball and they come back and they're really advocates for Chinese in the school. So make use of that. So I think that's something I'd like to add about the impact of these programs. Yeah. Um, challenges. Well, obviously, <laughs> geopolitical challenges are there and need navigating and thinking about. And that, again, comes back to advocacy and the importance of doing that and making sure that you're doing that, I think, rather than thinking, oh, well, it'll be all right, because it might not be. But also that means in the UK context, I think making sure that the teaching is really good and that results are good, um, because we're very high bound about results and it's a much more centrally um, based system in the UK. Um, I think what we've navigated quite well and I was quite pleased about was the online context of exchange. And I think that is something we're all going to have to think about. The, the big highlight for exchange, if you ask any of our children, if they were here today, was it's the interaction with Chinese peers mm -hmm. and the interaction with the face-to-face, -face, but also um, when we did the virtual trips, because we did very big virtual trips to China during the pandemic. Mm. And they had some surprising results, actually, because some of the children who apparently don't really speak in class at all, really, um, found their confidence in the virtual space and speaking not in front of lots of people who knew me in my class, but with somebody from China in a virtual chat room. Um, and so the, the results were quite unexpectedly good for the shy, for, I don't know whether it's the shyer, but the ones who are less willing to speak out in class. Now, so that's one thing that needs to be taken account of, but also what I think is really important for us to build these people-to-people -people relationships is what do we do in the online context, especially in the, in the, in the, in the space, you know, we've been thinking about that today in this, between visits. And what I'd like to see again, and what I don't think's picked up in the UK again yet, is there are school exchanges. Now, school exchanges always were a little bit school partnerships. All right, it's your turn to visit us this summer and we'll visit you next summer. And not a lot happens in between. Um, but some of those haven't actually picked up at all since the pandemic. They, they're very happy for people like the Institute of Education to organize the trip, but they're not organizing their own. But also, what can we do in the online space to build those partnerships during the school year? And we've just run quite a successful project, a partnership project, with just 15 schools across China and 15 UK schools with their partner schools, developing some online materials that we've done, one very basic topic around my life, my surroundings, but one a bit more sophisticated around the environment and, and rubbish, one around transportation, and building those with Chinese partner schools. So, We've had trouble with the time zone. We've had trouble with tech. There's lots more I could say. There's not much yeah. context to say it now. But I don't think we should give up because I think yeah. it's where we can really build that people-to-people -people relationship. And, and we think about it for two things, A, because it's really important, and B, because it really motivates students in China and the UK to actually be able to talk to each other. It's, so, it's interesting you mentioned time zones, because I didn't know until I moved to California how challenging it is to do time zone here, because actually the East Coast is a lot easier to do China East Coast exchange than it is in California. So that's also a huge challenge here. John, you mentioned some challenges in the, you know, the political environment. 
What other challenges are we seeing at the university level with regard to some of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, take my own institution as an example. So since the pandemic, we have, uh, before can pandemic, we had a partnership with the Beijing Normal University. Mm. So each year we regularly send our students there to study abroad or uh, for either short-term uh, stay or long-term stay. And since the pandemic, we, uh, we also moved our program to Taiwan. Um, and m most of our Chinese majors and minors have been to Taiwan either through the journey program or through like language learning program. So they are really looking for other sites. <laughs> they want to visit China. Um, but the problem is uh, the school partnerships have have been suspended for several years. So uh, re-navigating, you know, the relationship and you know re-establishing the partnership um, poses a problem for our students. And students always look for reliable, uh, credible. Uh, programs. It's not just any program. They just, you know, can participate and join. Um, and the other thing is, uh, university students always look for credit transfer. So if the uh, partner university or the study abroad university cannot offer the credit transfer, that would become a realistic problem for our students. Mm. And lastly, for uh, public universities, our students rely on funding pretty much. So scholarship opportunities. So financial support is very important to make the trip possible for them. Yeah, I think one of the other things that's come up is, of course, that the State Department has a travel warning mm -hmm. level three for China right now. And so a lot of universities, I think, especially public universities in the US, just will not entertain an exchange program with a country that has that kind of a travel warning. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's another interesting stumbling block. Chunjun, how about for you? What, what are some of the challenges that you're seeing either in your work at China Institute or more broadly in the field in terms of these types of exchanges? Well, something very practical, the yeah. airfare. Yeah, that's true too. <laughs> well, we are, we're just uh, yeah. still watching very closely because as, as well, we mentioned in funding and, and well, financial is a big part of bringing students to China. Like the youth leadership program, we, we are lucky that we are working with the Chinese Association for International Exchange, CEAIE, to cover the, uh, the China part, the expense. So we can really lower the program fee uh, to the minimum for students here. But still, to be able to afford the flight to China, to many schools, uh, to many students, well, it's still a big challenge. Um, and also the bigger part, like you mentioned, the level three. Uh, yep. the, well, we had a online forum talking about the new horizon. Uh, we partnered with the US Heartland Chinese Association that's uh, working with a lot of uh, states and schools in the middle of the country. Sure. Um, and we, we were well discussed that level three mm. uh, because well for many school leaders to yeah. be able to travel to China mm -hmm. uh, at whether it's the higher education level or K to 12, that's probably a barrier. Yeah. That's very likely a barrier. The lawyers do not like it. I will no. say that much. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and then, uh, one last thing, because well, we are a nonprofit uh, with the financial support that students need. Uh, we try to raise funding. We do like, well, like three weeks ago, I was writing uh, sponsor, calling for sponsorship letters oh. to sponsors and to corporate corporations. But it is, well, given the climate, while well, individuals, it's okay, but well, for the, at the in the business set, sector, because of the, 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 the bigger context to the tension, while the, the corporations, the business, while they are more yeah, stepping concerned, back. stepping back. Yeah, yeah. So it, it is well, still in you know, an indirect way or direct way uh, affecting our program. Yeah. Wen Ting, how about your parents? How do they feel about your program? Are there, I, I remember like I've, you know, taken kids to China for years and there were always those anxious parents and like how have your parents, how have you dealt with the parent population at your school to kind of sell them on this trip? Yeah, that's a very interesting topic as a challenge, I would say. Yeah. Um, yes, um, I think Zhang Laoshi and also Xinjian mentioned about the financial support. Mm -hmm. um, this is a key to running the program successfully as a public charter school. How are we going to make sure every student will have the equitable access to this program? So one thing we did as a fundraising 
that's the whole community effort. And also, we, we, we need to find the donors, you know, to, to just fund our program to make it sustainable. And in terms of the parents' challenge, yeah. we thinking about taking 39, 13, 14 years old middle schoolers on a 17 days trip. I think as all you can see, your administrators, your teachers, um, just thinking about taking your middle schooler even on a one day trip, how would it feel? Versus taking them on a 17 days trip, how would the parents? In addition to that, our school has a policy that we develop. We do not allow our students to bring the cell phones. That's right. Mm. Oh. Mm. oh. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that. OK, so adding another layer of, oh, as a parent, I'm going to send my kids to China yeah. for 17 days without a cell phone. And you would only allow us to call once during the trip. Hmm, how will you make sure they're safe, mm -hmm. right? And we still have some parent education that we need to continue you know, just doing our work to make sure you know, the safety that they're in China and also the communication to the parents to have the buy-in ahead of the time. So towards the end, we have no problems have the parents to sign the contract. They have to say, I'm not allowing my students to bring the cell phone. It's not like I'm gonna sneakily put the cell phone in their luggage. No, we don't do that. We don't allow them to do that because we wanna you know, really create an environment for those teenagers because they're on the screen a lot. Yeah. Right. We really want to create opportunity and space for them yeah. to really, you know, do the people to people connections. Yeah. So this yeah. is the challenge that we were facing and we're still facing. There's a lot of practical challenges like that. Actually, we just had our kids, I said, come back, a group from, uh, came back from Beijing and Dali, and then a group from Taiwan. And the Taiwan students I was talking to, one of them just couldn't tell, keep telling me about what life was like without a cell phone. And I was like, well, what about Taiwan? Like, what did you learn? It was like, and it really changed my perspective. And he just, all he wanted to talk about was the way his life was transformed by not having a cell phone. So these are really, really transformative experiences. <laughs> What, let's look a little bit toward the future because it's clear that we all have, especially in the United States, work to do in this topic. I want to give each of you the chance to give us a few words of advice. What can we do going forward? What recommendations do you have for us as a field or as schools or as universities that we can do a better job of connecting our students to the world, of hopefully having our students play a constructive and collaborative role in building uh, a more robust and positive U.S.-China relationship and more generally relationships between our students and the students of the Chinese-speaking world. So I'll throw that out and anybody can start, but what are, your, what are your final words of advice for us in terms of next steps? Well, from it, yeah. like the UK, the other side of the pond, I can Do say. It. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think we need to, and I can say that because I don't think there's anybody from the Department for Education here, but I think we need to establish at a, a, a macro level the, the dialogues that we had government to government. It was education dialogues, people to people dialogues. Okay, these are big set piece pieces, but be, you know, leading up to them, there's a lot of discussion at official level, which does facilitate things. So that's one, the big, the big thing. At a, at a smaller level, um, at us, our level of teachers, and building up to these programs, whether it's actually taking children and what you want to achieve when you're there, or what you want to try and achieve online with your partner school in China. Teacher training and communication and trust is really important. So I think, for instance, the Institute of Education, we could do more on working with teachers to think about how they prepare teaching materials for online engagement throughout the year and how they'd work with their Chinese partners and also, when we're in China, we, for instance, this, the, the group that's going this year, the large though it is, we will provide training for the teachers in China. Not to say they've got to teach the UK way, but so that they're really up to date with the level that the British students will be at and the kind of expectations. Again, we're not saying that it's got to be taught the way that they've always been taught, but so that the Chinese teachers have an idea of what to expect. So I think there's lots of actual detail work which can really make the investment in these things because it's a big investment in time and as you said a big investment in money um, to make it really work for all of us and really improve and have a, a even bigger impact than it already is doing. 
yeah, the official sponsorship and, and, and initiative really, really helps us do our work at the ground, grassroots level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What other thoughts do you want to leave us with, panel? Uh, I can go. Would you go for it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I would. Uh, I would suggest at the K twelve level, um, thinking about uh, thinking about this global exchange, the program that you want your students experience. Thinking of the big picture, right? What is the ultimate goal of, for students to go on this trip? What you want them to achieve, and to start from there and backward, you know, planning your trip. This is one thing logistically, and also uh, programming wide. And another thing is logistically, don't be afraid of start to plan the program, not just to thinking, oh my gosh, it's so much work. Don't just to start it. And there's so much connections and the help on the way that eventually will help you to achieve your goal. And just to say to that, um, you mean charter school, we're doing our model share and we're really happy to support all the K-12 level schools. If you want to start your exchange program or wants to learn from us, we're happy to help for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, well, um, I think the overall goal would be to bring the number 200 to 300 to back to 50,000 students yeah. study Absolutely. abroad. <laughs> that would be the overall goal. Uh, I think in order to achieve that, there are a few things I'm quite interested in. First is to compile you know, resources um, that are credible, you know, credible programs that we feel safe to recommend our students students to participate in. Um, the, other, the other thing is pedagogically, I would like to see more innovative approaches approaching this experience. Yeah. In connection with uh, the talks this morning with the AI use, I definitely can see a lot of like the Conigo yeah. tools yeah. used, you know, during the study abroad experience that can students can use them as tools to navigate their experience there. So the use of a technology, language learning experience, and the culture tour should go hand in hand. I really want to see more innovative approaches that involve all of them. Yeah, and even for our US and Chinese students to look at something like AI mm -hmm. and Silicon Valley and the Chinese tech industry and how these two things are, are very different, how we're competing, how we're collaborating, et cetera. Shadyan, you have the last word. What words of advice do you have for our educators out there in the field? Um, I, well, these are all incredible programs. I think, yeah. well, the, um, well, if you have students already um, on the trip to China or have a great China story, well, how to maximize that story to affect your community? Because uh, I love, Chris, well, you're telling your story, your son and, well, your students joining <laughs> China Institute yeah. story. These individual stories are powerful. So if you can find ways to uh, encourage them to share their stories with your class, with your school communities, maybe that will drive some of the fundraising efforts. Yes. Uh, that will be so powerful directly coming from your students. Another thing is really working with all different levels. Uh, so we, are, we, we, we cannot be successful alone. Uh, we are here as a community working together, um, but also think about your school, uh, the school leaders, how to, how to support their understanding of China so that well, they will have that kind of perspective and understanding to support a study tour program to China for your students. Um, so, uh, and also lastly, I think, well, everyone here, uh, we are also a bridge of the culture. I was just in a panel uh, talking about language and culture. Uh, as Chinese language teachers, or as someone who been to China uh, to study Chinese language, we, we have our personal um, experience on this bridge. And we, we should also share that. We should really impact well through our passion uh, and bring this to our students. I think this is such a powerful message to end on because I think whether educators, teachers, or for our students, I really have this dream that my students will become like Dr. Kong, who was here and started us off this morning, the ambassadors of the future, the people, the diplomats, not just in government, but at every level of society in bridging these cultural, these political gaps that we have and in helping us meet some of the challenges we have with people-to-people -people exchange. Um, you mentioned my son, so I'll end on, I started with my son, I'll end on my son. So, 
He had that experience with the kids from Hangzhou. Next year, we, he went to Hangzhou with his school. Then he went to Chengdu, and he became an Yingxiong for eating the hottest la jiao <laughs> in Sichuan. So these experiences are transformational in so many ways, both cognitively and in sometimes in terms of your gut. But anyway, that's a whole other story. I want to thank the panelists here for giving us such a rich picture of what's happening at every level. I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing in your schools and institutions. And I'm excited tomorrow because I think 30 or 40 of you are going to come over to my school in San Francisco. And we'll get to actually tell you maybe a little bit more about our travel programs, which I didn't get too much time to talk about today. So we'll leave it there, folks. Thanks, everybody, for joining virtually and in person. And thanks to our wonderful panelists. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.